So just so everybody knows the room that they're in, you're in the uh, uh, building the interconnected ecosystem. Discussion on the container network interface and the OCI projects. Abby wrote the title for me, so I had to read that. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're pleased to have a uh, illustrious group uh, of people uh, here to join us today uh, for a panel discussion on container networking, things that are happening at CNCF and OCI, um, in fact, how maybe they relate to Cloud Foundry and, and our ecosystem and our platform. Um, so I'm gonna start by letting everyone introduce themselves to you. Uh, later, we'll, we'll open it up for questions. I've got a few seed questions to start the discussion. Um, so why don't we start with Chris? Hello, hello, hello. my name is uh, Chris Hanizek. Currently, uh, I'm acting uh, executive director for the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and I'm also part of the Linux Foundation, serving as a vice president of developer programs involved uh, with the Open Container Initiative and some other initiatives within uh, the Linux Foundation. Uh, my name's Craig, I'm a product guy at Google. Um, I work mostly in the compute space and was one of the co-founders of the Kubernetes project. I am number two, it says so on my microphone, sorry. My name is Richard Kaufman. I run a research group at Samsung, and we work on cloud-native technologies for uh, use within the Samsung group and for others. Outstanding. Well, thank you all for, uh, for being here. So let's start with a really simple question. Why do we care about networks and containers? <laughs> Who wants to field that one? Why do we care? Uh, yeah, after no, 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 you. No, I want to hear what you're going to say. Um, so stuff has to talk to something sometime. <laughs> and, and that's the technical answer? <laughs> so from a technical perspective, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm constantly worrying about problems like 400 million endpoints want to communicate uh, to some kind of a central service. So um, I'm looking for... Uh, exceptionally high performance, low overhead ways for those connections to happen. So for me, uh, because uh, containers are the selected efficient method mechanism for building and deploying applications and services, how I can efficiently plumb those to those 400 million endpoints is very, very important. And I'd say just kind of, you know, building on that a little bit, um, Containers represent this incredibly portable atom of deployment. So they've really solved uh, an early problem, which was, you know, how do I actually package and distribute a piece of software, and how do I make it available in a given environment? And you know, one of the things that we really need to get to is a point where we have a very rich uh, ecosystem of management capabilities for these containers that can go anywhere. And those management capabilities, those management platforms, need to be integrated into a very rich and diverse set of physical uh, infrastructure environments. And you know, one of the, the gnarliest challenges um, you know, in the space really is how do I actually map a container, which is an application level construct, to the network? And how do I control how it interacts with other uh, pieces of, of the network? And how do I actually elevate you know, some of the concepts to almost the application level so that I'm able to intelligently program the network based on my application's needs? And so it's, it's a really uh, tough and interesting uh, problem. And you know, we've obviously been working together as a community to try to you know, find nice, clean, simple ways to start handling that integration. That's good. You have nothing? That's, they've said it pretty well. So. All right, there it is, Chris's answer. <laughs> <laughs> what they said. All right, fair enough. So, so I've, I'll continue to ask questions, but uh, we've got a mic in the middle. I, I am actually going to pick on people in the audience if no one stands up there to ask a question. So uh, a couple of you out there uh, might need to ask some questions. <laughs> Did, didn't we decide that the best question got promoted to the panel? Well, that might not be an incentive. <laughs> <laughs> Although those are, that's a great format. Um, so actually, I, I'm going to direct my next question to, to Craig. Um, Cloud Foundry has been looking at uh, the, the problem within our platform of, of container to container networking, different ways that we could think about that problem. You know, we're, we're, we're thinking through the abstractions that are appropriate for our users, um, but being heavily involved in Kubernetes. Kubernetes has selected the container networking interface as its approach to um, tying together containers. Um, so what, what was the, the Kubernetes project's perspective in making that decision versus perhaps some of the other alternatives that are out there? That's yeah, a great question. I mean, there were, 
There are really two kind of viable alternatives. Um, at the time, uh, there was uh, libnetwork, which is uh, Docker's implementation of, of essentially uh, this function. And then there was uh, a new, relatively nascent project that was being sponsored by our friends at CoreOS um, that was part of the AppSea specification. And uh, you know, we put a lot of time and thought into it. Obviously, we, we're very invested in Docker as a, as a container uh, format, as a runtime environment. Um, and you know, as, a, as an ecosystem enabler. But we really struggled when we started looking at how to tie a uh, Kubernetes run container into the lib network infrastructure. You can really think about Docker as being you know, perhaps three things. And you know, I, I tend to think of it as, as, as three discrete things in a way. One is you know, Docker is a, a format, a way to actually describe something you put in a container. Docker is also a container runtime environment. So actually that, that local way to take that and run it and then Docker is also, at the highest level, a complete stack that gives you everything you might need from you know, describing a container, describing how it ties together, and then you know, deploying it out using something like Swarm. And we really struggled uh, in the early days to uh, disentangle the lib network implementation from the rest of Docker's infrastructure. So if you actually look at the way that it's implemented, uh, it pulls through a tremendous amount of the core Docker capabilities. Um, so, for instance, uh, it's tied to um, something called libkv, uh, which is a, you know, a distributed key value store. And so we'd have to have stood up a discrete key value store and run it in parallel with this thing. And it wasn't neatly tied into our sort of ecosystem. We also felt that the interface was a little overly complex, given what we wanted to accomplish. Um, and it was tied you know, deeply to things like the Docker daemon, uh, which uh, you know, necessitated you know, even, even further and deeper dependencies. And then when we looked at uh, we looked at what the AppC guys had proposed with um, with uh, CNI, it was very simple, like very simple API, very simple surface area, uh, clean, uh, really you know well factored, and we felt like it was something that could you know you know really you know build we could build on it, and so for us it was really just a, a sort of a necessary thing. It was, it, was, it was very difficult to actually just use the libnetwork capabilities to disentangle it from a lot of the other uh, Docker componentry uh, and then you know, look at that as a standard. The, the, the CNI interface was just so much cleaner. Richard, hey, how about your perspective on this? Samsung's so it par parallels Craig's quite a bit, which is um, when Kubernetes was looking at networking interfaces, uh, there's a very influential blog post I'd point you to from Tim Hawkins uh, that's posted on Kubernetes.io about this. But basically, you know, they tried using um, Live Network and you know, pretty much found out that by, by the time they pulled it up, they found everything, including somebody's kidney attached to the dependency chain. And it was much easier. You know, they, they, they tried very hard to use it and only went a different direction because they were forced to. And Craig was talking about how simple the, uh, the CNI API is. It's got three entries, add a network, delete a network, and look at its configuration. Uh, it's also composable, so you can basically have one implementation of it inside another implementation, so you can experiment with new networks and new versions in a nice, clean, and easy way. Um, but I think at the higher level uh, point is you want layers in the system to know what they're good at and only, only work on their area. You don't want big monolithic things. It's a religious war almost, but you really want Kubernetes to be good at orchestration. You want the CNI layer to be really, really good at, at encapsulating networking technologies that work from everything from uh, like a development-oriented network that's a, you know, a software SDN to something that would be used in massive production. Yeah. So it's better at um, composability and separability of function and, and not having complex yeah. dependencies. Keats to the Unix philosophy. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Any chance I could get you to run over? Actually, I'll come over to you. How about that? I'll join the audience. Hey, um, so the panel was about OCI and CNI, and I was, if you haven't talked about this yet, I'm curious how you see those two things fitting together. Um, as far as I can tell, everyone who might be considering using CNI is also r using Run C to run their containers. Mm -hmm. So is there some synergy? Or are we going to make those two things work together more closely? So 
OCI or open, the Open Container Initiative is really all about um, standardizing on the kind of how you manage the actual container runtime with like Run C, and also specifically how the image format is is defined. Uh, networking per se is out of scope uh, within the OCI, so things like CNI wouldn't actually be part of OCI. But they the intention of and making sure, making sure things work together cleanly um, is, is definitely uh, you know part of the project. But the actual hosting and development of CNI would it is not in scope of the actual OCI charter. So if you actually look, if you go to the OCI website, there's this wonderful thing called the OCI scope table, which talks about which things are actually in scope of the project and which things are out of scope. Hopefully that answers your Can question. I have a follow up. Um, sure. So <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think he should be on the panel. <laughs> so well, for Cloud Foundry, we're moving towards using uh, Run C to run our containers, yep. and we're moving towards using CNI to drive networking. Yep. Um, and we're going to end up building a little adapter that is, fits in between those two things. And um, is every container orchestrator going to be building their own version of this adapter? Should we try to standardize on one? So. Rocket has a, C, has a CNI plugin built in. When you say CNI plugin, you mean a, a thing that's driven through the CNI interface or a thing that drives through this? Like a, the thing that drives yeah. the oh, okay. is yeah. built into Rocket. Docker, there's a piece of plumbing that you have to plug okay. in that lets it use a CNI plugin. That's what the Calico and Weave guys built. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Let's see, from the perspective of an application or service writer, the, the two things that um, uh, the, container sorry, the container initiative and the networking initiative have in common is that they're two things that they never want to learn about, <laughs> never want to care about, and never want to bite them in the butt. And um, just as much as they stay out of each other's hair is a good thing. Why shouldn't I be able to take the input to a CNI plugin and make that part of my run C bundle? Like, why not add that as a field to run C? A fair answer might be politics, or yeah. a fair answer might be out of scope technology. <laughs> it's out of scope. Yeah. I mean, like, it's you know one one thing to think about is this. Um, you know, CNI is really just a a way to express uh, an integration point with um, you know a variety of technologies. Um, it's relatively early days. Uh, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of room to kind of innovate and extend and, 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 uh, and progress. Um, you know, Docker is obviously uh, doing amazing work, you know, in a lot of areas, but they're also looking at the problem holistically. Like, they're trying to th think about how to create a complete stack that goes from, you know, the way you would create a container, the way you deploy a container, the way you'd orchestrate a container, the way you'd update a container, the way you'd manage it. And they're really thinking about the system you know, in, in, in my opinion, like holistically, and they're looking at that, that holistically, we're coming at it from a different angle. Like a lot of us who are active in this uh, community are trying to look at a disaggregate, interesting set of pieces. We just have a, a different set of priorities. And so, um, you know, I would hope that over time, um, you know, Docker and, you know, adopts CNI, that, that it actually becomes sufficiently mature and sufficiently obvious that it's just a, a great way to go. Um, but I think, you know, from their perspective, they're, they're trying to look at that, that holistic story and, and try to create it that way. So just a different set of priorities, I think. Um, but my expectation is that, you know, as this gets adopted, as we actually have really, you know, high quality plugins, you look at what the Calico guys have done, it's really neat technology, right? Um, and if it's made, you know, available through CNI, and that's the easiest way to integrate it, um, I would expect that it will become more ubiquitous and, and, and by necessity will we'll end up in that direction. Any other questions from the audience? No? Okay. So we, we talked a little bit about um, you know, the technology and whether or not particular runtimes need to implement, and whether maybe we should standardize on that. Uh, but let's just talk about CNI itself. Um, CNI itself was, was obviously created by CoreOS as part of, um, you know, part of their work around containerization, their set of opinions. Um, it, it's building a bit of momentum. We've seen Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry and others adopt it. Um, what, what, what's the right home for it? Does it belong in CNCF? If so, is there you know, an update on status? Is that happening? Any discussions occurring? Uh, I mean, yeah, I could talk a little bit to this. Um, so I did mention that you know, uh, 
networking is out of scope in OCI doesn't mean that it will be out of scope forever. So potentially the uh, TOB or the technical oversight uh, board there could decide that all of a sudden networking is in scope and uh, it makes sense to put CNI there. But for now, that's uh, not the current mindset uh, where they are. Um, we've had some discussions within CNCF uh, to, to, to see if CNI could, could fit within the purview of CNCF. Um, uh, there is discussions of potentially putting a proposal together um, kind of in, in, in the short term, uh, but there is a body of people within the CNCF that essentially make the decision of whether uh, CNI maps to the overall mission of CNCF uh, and you know, whether the project meets some of the criteria of what it means to be a CNCF project. CNCF is generally looking for kind of um, you know, high velocity, uh, you know, really good quality uh, projects with kind of diverse, um, you know, committership. Um, CNI kind of falls on the, um, you know, it, it's a super important project, but you know, it's it, it's a very small piece. It's like it's a very simple, um, you know, you know, code and, and, and associated spec. So, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but I was uh, one of the initiating members of CNCF, um, and I'm the uh, chairman of the the board um, um, group. So. The, the, the interesting question is, you know, is, and this is, a, this, is a, this is an ongoing debate inside our own community, is, is CNCF a standards organization? And I think the overwhelming uh, answer is no, it's not a standards-based group, right? Like, we're actually a, a organization that's responsible for homing technology, like, you know, like implementations, and creating a great framework so that those technologies work well together. And over time, maybe standards will emerge, right? And that's, that's, that's the way we kind of approach this. We didn't want to lead with a standard. We didn't want to like come in this and say, you know, hey, we're going to design the heck out of this API and it's going to be a standard and then we'll stand up an implementation later. What we really wanted to do was say, let's take it from the other side. Let's see what people actually use. Let's get some great technology. Let's pull it together. Let's see what people use. And over time, you know, when it becomes clear that this is what people want, this is the actual thing that is being universally deployed, when it hits a certain threshold of critical mass, we can then look at the APIs and make a decision as to is this API fit to become a standard? Can we promote it to become a standard? And so, you know, when we think about the evolution of uh, CNI uh, and the role of CNI in the space, um, at the moment, there's, you know, there's, at, you know, when we were having these conversations, you know, Kubernetes had implemented CNI, um, but it was, you know, the, we just hadn't seen a lot of, you know, other organizations and groups that really adopt it, embrace it, and, and, and sort of use it. We're at a very different point today. I mean, if you actually look at what CF's doing, it's like, wow, that actually adds a tremendous amount of legitimacy to this, uh, to this as a potential standard, because it actually is now a common way to integrate between you know, two of the sort of preeminent ways to, to orchestrate these systems. Mm -hmm. You look at Mesos, actually, including mm -hmm. CNI, and now it's like, holy cow, like, and now we actually have like, pretty much all of the mainstream um, orchestrators supporting it. And so I would argue that over time, um, it would be really good, good to get to a point where we have a couple of projects under management of CNCF that are actually implementing CNI. It has enough miles in it that we're pretty confident it covers the use cases. Um, and when we get to a point where we're getting a lot of demand from the vendor community, when they're saying like, hey, this really needs to be a standard. We need to be able to bet on this. We don't want it changing. You know, we want, like, when the, when the community really needs us to formalize that, that's when we need to have the conversation around whether we would actually introduce the formal standard as part of, of, of CNCF. But I think we're a little bit away from that still. So Kubernetes tells applications how they network the pieces of their application together and how those talk to the outside world. So there's a model of how every pod has an IP address and, um, and how those are allowed to talk to each other. So that's really valuable because that means I, when I write my application and I deploy it someplace, I know it's going to have that behavior. So what's the benefit of standardizing CNI? is in the plugins actually. So is there an ecosystem of people like Calico, like um, CoreOS Flannel, like you know, you can name a half a dozen other things that plug in there and work. And I think there will be benefit to the community to have that ecosystem be supported by one of the foundations somewhere, somehow. Um, but uh, there's, I think Craig was showing that uh, you, know, you have to exercise taste and judgment as to when the right time comes to elevate that API as the way that you'll do that and there, when there is enough interest in the community to maintain that ecosystem. So I think it's really fair. I, I, I want to then, I'm going to shift the conversation um, 
a lot of that was inside baseball. That's really important to maybe a lot of people that are here, but it, it, frankly, it's industry inside baseball. Um, within the Cloud Foundry community, I, I, I think there's two major user sets that, that we're thinking about. This is a bit of an open-ended question. I'm looking for some, you know, your comments on this. The first user community is the, community is the obvious one. They're the application developer. And for us, it's, it's, it's code to running system, right? That's kind of our, our general mantra. Um, and there's some challenges and questions about you know, what level of knowledge does a software developer focused on business algorithms and you know, solving business problems, what level of knowledge do they need to have about how you know, any of the networking components actually work? I think that's still a bit of an undiscovered, uh, you know, undetermined level of knowledge. Um, the flip side, though, is that we have, um, we live in the real world of data centers that exist in the enterprise that are a blend of platforms, everything from existing mainframes and you know, networking equipment. And this is something that, that most people live in, in real, the real world all the time, um, frequently without any type of software-defined networking even existing. And so we have these two different tensions. There's the infrastructure up perspective, where we want to tie cloud-native platforms together with existing, quote, legacy. My, new, my favorite new word for this is vintage systems. <laughs> I'll use that one next time. Nice. Oh, okay. One second. Artisanal. Artisanal vintage systems. That was a wonderful year, 1985. <laughs> so we want to be able to solve for both of these problems, giving application developers just enough information, but not get in their way to make it really simple for them to write apps, focus on solving their problems, yet fit into a bigger data center strategy. So that was a kind of an open-ended set of comments. Um, at, how does so, Samsung think about that? So, sort of a continuation of what I said the last time, which is, uh, for example, Kubernetes gives applications one model to understand their networking, mm -hmm. and then underneath that, implementing that abstraction, we have stuff like the CNI plugins. Mm -hmm. the, um, if you think about it from the perspective of the application writer of not wanting to know what, how the network is implemented, they kind of want to take the thing that's on their whiteboard, which says, you know, hey, I've got these services that talk to these components that need to talk to these users, and I want to, you know, map a network that has the least amount of exposed ports to the least amount of exposed other actors, and then get that mapped onto hardware. So that, that's, that's what they want. Um, and uh, the stuff that you were talking about, type one are the application deployers, type two are the infrastructure deployers. The type two infrastructure deployers want the described services to be, to be deployable instantly so that they meet the application constraints, but in a way that the, app, the, the infrastructure managers can understand what's going on and they can do their um, wide level, like you know, their intrusion detection and their threat detection stuff. So you've got multiple actors wanting to do it. The only way that you have to implement it that makes sense is to have those split levels of abstraction. You give the application writers an understanding that matches what they want to understand and know more, and then you give the underneath that, where CNI lives, you want to give them the tools so that they can get in there and manage things. And the only way you have a chance to build that ecosystem is to make each of those layers so shit simple that um, you Another can technical term. underneath. I like that technical term too. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to just sort of riff on that, you know, a little bit. You know, one of the things that I think is kind of a, a real sort of seminal point around things like Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes or any of these, these new uh, systems is that they're far more intrinsically dynamic than anything we've seen today, right? Like, you know, traditionally people would look at um, sort of actively managed systems as, as really being, you know, the, the sort of front-end systems that serve, you know, varying uh, consumer-oriented workloads. So, so that's, that's the classic place where you'd, you'd see, like, dynamic systems in, in, in most of these sort of architectures. We're now getting to a point where, like, the dynamicism is pushed, like, right into almost every application class you have, right? These systems will, you know, decide how many instances of something needs to run and create the right level of abstractions to, to tie them together. And you know, as a result of that, they're far more intrinsically operationally viable, right? The developer really shouldn't be aware of most of the operations functions. A scaling event for them is a non-event. They, they don't even—they're not even aware of it. They're not—they're not cognizant of it. Things might get turned down and activated later, you know, when they're needed. Um, and all of that should be completely opaque to the developer. But to make that dream a reality, you have to have a really smart system that's actually able to program the underlying physical infrastructure, right? You have to have a well-defined set of interfaces that work pretty much everywhere. 
And a lot of these systems that are emerging um, have some really interesting and novel network models to make that, that possible. And to get there, you know, it's actually to, to let, like, unlock these, these, these capabilities, we have to have a really principled, well-defined, structured interface uh, between these orchestrators and the, fun, the underlying systems. And that should not be the purview of the developer. Like, the, you know, there's, a, there's a different operations team that actually figures out how to actually provide that cluster environment or that cloud foundry environment, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then you know, the developers are just focused on the application level pieces. And the final piece of it is, um, often as not, you want to be able to preserve the developer's intent. Like you want to be able to say, hey, this service needs to talk to the service a lot, right? And it's going to, like with high bandwidth and low latencies. They, they're, very, they're very code dependent. And you need to be able to preserve that intent or provide a framework for the developer to express that intent so that when these dynamic systems under the covers are actually making informed decisions about where to place things and how many to run, um, that intent gets passed through and can be used to actually program the underlying network fabric and make sure you have the right quality of service between services and, and all those other pieces. And so I think it's, uh, it's, it's a really interesting space. I mean, a lot of it is uh, relatively nascent compared to where I think it's going to go. And I think you'll find that like that boundary between um, these systems and the modern sort of NFE or SDN type subsystems are going to be really important to get right. Looks like uh, we've got a question over here from the audience. We've got about three minutes left, so Matt, you'll be the last audience question. This is when we get the hard question. <laughs> I don't know that it's a hard question. Just to kind of follow up on your statement, uh, it sounds like you have a number of things in mind, and I'm kind of hoping that you can um, discuss what the roadmap is for CNI, because right now it's really, really basic and really, really easy. But like you said, there's a lot of things there when it comes to expression of intent, expression of policy. They're all lacking right now in the API, and you leave it up to the implementations. I'm just kind of curious if you have a notion of what that roadmap for the future of CNI might not look like. I'll give the first easy answer, which is that if you look at the GitHub page for it, you'll see the roadmap. And the two things that are on the roadmap right now, one is dynamic changes to the network once the system is up and running. Actually, I think that's two versions of that are just the only thing on the roadmap. There we go. But, dude, check the GitHub. Okay. It's all developed in the open. I don't know what else. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a great question. I mean, the, the answer is um, only a very small portion of these decisions are going to be driven directly in the CNI context, right? Yeah. A lot of this is being driven in, like, the Cloud Foundry organization or in the Kubernetes organization or in a lot of the dependent communities. And so I, I don't think we can, with a straight face, like lay out to you what the CNI roadmap is right now. I think what, what we can say is that each of the communities will create an, an interesting and novel set of requirements. Um, some of those requirements will be you know, pushed into an evolution of the, the CNI interface. A lot of it will actually exist above, uh, you know, above, above the CNI framework. But you know, I, I, just, I don't think anyone knows right now because um, we just haven't had the, the physical conversations around, you know, the discrete needs of each of these organizations and, and really brought that back to the... So, so Chris looks like he had this thought? Did you have one? No. No, you just, just one, look anxious. One, so one quick thing, which is, because I'm on this panel, I asked some folks in my team, hey, what's going on with this? Next thing I know, I saw, saw something that showed up in our roadmap. We've got this little thing called Kraken, which makes it easy to... Um, deploy Kubernetes onto Amazon or to a cluster of Nux or GCE or wherever. And all of a sudden, CNI showed up on our roadmap, so we're going to integrate it into Kraken at some point. So that's a public thing, by the way, if you want an easy way to test out Kubernetes. So Abby Kern says one quick question. I said that Matt was the last, but go ahead. Um, Yell it out. I, she, I, one last question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I wanted to wrap it up here, because I do think we talked a lot about Inside Baseball, is um, we've talked a lot about pr different projects, CNI, OCI, um, some other acronyms I'm sure that we could probably add into the mix. ABC, XYZ. <laughs> but one of the things that's been a really a big theme this week is interoperability and collaboration. And maybe we can wrap up the panel with talking about how that makes us a better community. Yep. Final thoughts, collaboration across projects. It's, it's, absolutely, it's utterly essential. Um, one of the key responsibilities we have is to support innovation at almost every level of the stack. And if we exist in a world where you have to be you know, this high to actually be able to solution because you have to deliver at every level of the stack, uh, we've let the community down. But we need to create an opportunity where if you have a crazy awesome visualization framework, 
you can actually bring it to a plethora of environments. If you have a crazy, awesome way to actually do overlay networking, you can bring it to these environments. And so I think that um, collaboration around you know, getting these sort of really well-defined sort of capabilities so that an innovator doesn't have to pick their ecosystem. An innovator doesn't have to say, you know what, I'm just betting everything on you know, Kubernetes, or I'm betting everything on CF, or I'm betting everything on whatever. They can actually uh, you know, look at something that's like, you know what, if I actually conform with the CNI interface, I actually get everything. Um, and so I think, I think collaborating as communities to actually start extricating and, and sort of standardizing all these pieces is, is essential for the efficiency of the broader community. Yeah, and with my kind of OCI and CNCF foundation hat on, I think it's kind of the role of foundations to kind of provide the avenue for this, you know, kind of collaboration and, and interoperability to happen. So OCI is providing, you know, the standard, you know, way to do uh, lifecycle management for the run container runtime and also the image format, you know, that will kind of be, you know, taken care of and people are collaborating there. Uh, CNCF kind of acting as your cloud native uh, commons, bringing together useful, uh, you know, cloud native technology under kind of one neutral umbrella where people could kind of collaborate um, and uh, interoperate with other foundations. We may have technology in CNCF, like, like if etcd ends up in CNCF, um, just another component that Cloud Foundry, you know, may use and, and so on. So I think foundations play a very critical role in, in, in enabling this interoperability to, to happen. So the sociological and political side of this is really important, but there's a technical aspect, which is architecting tasteful APIs that have minimal functions and certainly minimal dependencies and touch points, but sufficient to be able to produce very high performance capable systems, but not get in each other's hair all the time. Excellent, and with that, I'll thank you all for coming up here and participating. So thank thanks so everybody for coming. Thank you for hosting.